Now here is an interesting question. Once you get out of the opening stage of the game, what do you do? How do you find the best possible plan? Do you sit back and wait for your opponent to make a mistake? Do you attack on the king's side, the queen's side? Do you just start moving the pieces around? Do you go through the middle of the board, through the center? Well, if you sometimes have a problem finding the best possible plan, you are not alone, because even very strong, very experienced players sometimes find it difficult to come up with the best possible plan for every given position. Hopefully, after today's lecture, it will be a lot easier for you to find a plan. Because when everything else is equal, let's say we have a, a position that is dynamically balanced, if one side has no idea what to do next, but the other side has a clear cut plan and the clarity uh, ahead, then it won't be long before the side with a plan completely overwhelms the opponent. So planning is a very, very important part of the game. There are several components that you have to keep in mind, but today we are going to focus on only one of them. One component only, and that one is the pawn structure. So we will be looking at the pawn structure for the clues as to what to do next and how to create the plan for pretty much any given position. Rather than just talk, well, let's have a look at the example. And I'm going to look at the d4 opening. So after the introductory moves d4, and knight f6, white's next move is c4. When pawns are next to each other, they work very well together and they control many, many squares on the opponent's side of the board. So that's why c4 is such a good move. Black plays g6, and after knight c3, white is already declaring his intentions. He wants to play e4 and to obtain the full center, the full control over the central squares. Black allows white to proceed with his plan and the next move is e4. If you ask yourself who has the better center in this position, there is no doubt that white has more space and that white has much, much better control over the central squares. We have c4, d4 and e4 that are next to each other, they're controlling lots of squares on black side of the board, there is no doubt that white has the advantage when it comes to the center. Does it mean that white is better? Well, it's not so simple, because as you can see, black is ready to castle, black has his bishop on the longest diagonal, and black is ready to undermine white's center, or rather to start undermining white center, because that is a very important part. If black just sits back and does nothing, then white will be able to bring the pieces out, reinforce the center, and then start pushing black's forces back, and white will end up with a huge advantage. So the fact that black is so well developed, that the bishop is on the longest diagonal, that black is ready to castle, and white still needs few moves to do all of that, that gives black time to do something about the center and to start challenging the center. How is black going to do that? One way would be to go from the side and play a move like c5. Another way would be to prepare the move e5. So this is what we are going to look at. Black's next move is pawn to d6 and now we have the opening that is called King's Indian. When King's Indian appeared for the first time it was a hyper-modern opening, because when you compare this to e4, e5 openings or d4, d5 openings, black does something that is quite radical. Black allows white to create the full center and then does absolutely everything in his power to undermine it. Black played d6, white continues with the development, so next move is knight to f3. Black castles, and the bishop goes to e2, and now white is ready to castle as well. The time has come for black to start challenging white's center, and this is exactly what black is doing with the very next move, which is pawn from e7 to e5. White castles, maintaining the pressure. 
By the way, when it comes to chess, a, a lot of, is about counting. And um, in this position, you can see that white is attacking this pawn on e5 twice, with a knight and with a pawn. Black is only defending it once with a pawn. So what happens if I decides to snatch a pawn for free? Would that be possible? Well, let's have a look. Pawn takes, pawn takes, queen takes queen, rook takes, and now with knight e5, white is happy about the position because he just snatched a pawn. However, there is a strong response from black, and that is knight takes on e4. This is discovered attack because this bishop that has been uh, well pretty silent up until this moment, all of a sudden becomes very, very active. If knight takes knight and bishop takes knight, we now have equal material, but black's position is a lot better. Look at this bishop on e5. It really is dominating the board. White will have big problem finishing his queenside development because if white moves this bishop out, then he is going to lose the pawn on b2. If white plays a move like rook b1, then he will go into the pin with bishop to f5. Also, this knight is very fast going to c6 and d4 or b4 and, and creating the threats. Um, white can't really play b3, which would be a natural way to continue the development because of this bishop, he would lose the rook. And um, needless to say, this particular exchange does not work well for white at all. So instead of trying to get a free pawn after e5, Instead of trying to get a free pawn, after e5, white simply castles, keeping the pressure in the center of the board. And if black takes on d4, then the knight would appear over there and white's position would be better because now white truly has very clear situation in the center, controls more squares and would have a better chances of organizing the attack. Another option for black might be to put more pressure onto white center and to play the move knight c6. So now the knight, the pawn, and potentially this bishop as well are all fighting for the dark squares in the middle of the board. Here is the next move, pawn goes to d5. And this is now the so-called Mar del Plata variation of King's Indian. Knight goes to e7. And we can say that the opening stage of the game is finished. So what sort of a plan can we come up with in this kind of a position? And we will look for the best possible plan for white and the best possible plan for black. The first question that you need to ask yourself, should I be attacking on the king side or the queen side or the center of the board? And Typically, if someone is attacking you on one of the wings, it is quite strong to go through the middle. But in this particular case, the center of the board is blocked. Pawns e4, e5, d6 and d5 are blocking each other, they're not going anywhere. And so it is really not possible to do much in the middle of the board. White really needs to decide and whether he's going to attack on the king side or on the queen side. What about attacking on the king side? Well, if you look at black's position, this bishop is pointing towards the king side. The queen potentially can come out as well. Two knights, the bishop, the rook, they're all on the king side. So black has a great concentration of forces on the king side. If white decides to attack over there, then white is attacking a stronghold. And black's chances of repelling the attack and going for the counterattack would be much, much better than white coming up with anything concrete in this kind of a position. Have a look at the pawn on d5. This pawn gives more space to white on the queen side, the pawn on d5. This part of the board, it's quite clear that white has more space on the queen side. So it's been decided then, white will be playing 
on the queen side. And what about black? Well, if black accepts the battle on this part of the board, then uh, it's pretty clear that white will have the advantage. Now, why is that? Because, as I said, all the black pieces are either concentrated on the king side or pointing to the king side. Black really doesn't have too many things to fight a battle with on this part of the board. And so, while it is pretty clear that white should look for his chances on the queen side, black, on the other hand, should look for his chances on the king side in a direct attack on the white king. The next question that you need to ask yourself, once you've found out which part of the board you should be focused on, so the next question is to ask yourself, can I attack with pieces only or do I need maybe one or two pawns to help me out? When there are so many pawns on the board and in the absence of any clear weaknesses, it is quite obvious that the only way to attack in this kind of a position would be with the help of pawns. You can't really hope to bring the pieces only and to do much to black's position. So, if that's the case, how is white going to proceed? Well, if you are better on one part of the board, it helps to open up the position quite a bit on that part of the board, if possible. For white, that would mean coming up with c5 at some stage, not immediately, and then swapping those two pawns, which would give white a couple of targets to attack. One would be the uh, potentially weak backwards pawn um, on uh, d6, which cannot be protected by another pawn. And there would also be the c file that can be used for white pieces to get into black's position and start causing trouble. So the pawn on d6, the uh, uh, open c file, these are all pluses for white. And white can therefore start looking for ways to push this pawn on c5 and then exchange it for the pawn on d6. How about a very direct approach going with b4? b4 is actually quite a good move, but many people would hesitate to play a move like this because black can immediately attack white's pawn formation with a5. You can't defend with a3, you would simply lose a pawn, you can't take back because of the pin. And if you are tempted to just go b5 and close the position, this would actually be a big strategic mistake. Because now the part of the board that gives white an advantage, it's completely closed and there is no further play on the queen side. For that reason, what white needs to do is to avoid closing on the queen side by all means possible. So what, what is that one can do here? Um, more than one move, actually. One possibility would be to simply take on a5. Rook takes. And you can see white still can't play c5 and the next move b6 is coming. However, even though it is possible for black to slow white down on the queen side, it is not possible for black to completely stop white on the queen side. And so, Let's say white continues with knight to d2, b6, knight b3, rook now has to move out of the way, and white can proceed to open the position with a4 and then a5, and when those two pawns disappear, then it will be possible to go for c5. And what you can see that even though black might be able to slow white down a little bit, it is really not possible to close down the position on the queen side. And um, what you want to do when you decide on which side of, a, of, of the board you are going to play and, and focus on, what you want to do is to play as many moves as possible on the side of the board that is better for you. That doesn't mean that you should play only on the side of the board that is better for you, because often you might be given a chance to slow down your opponent, or even in some cases to completely stop your opponent from attacking you. That's the best case scenario because then you're, we are playing on one goal. If your opponent can't attack you on one wing, but you have the advantage on the other wing, well, that's really what it is. We are only playing on one goal from that moment on. You can keep on pressing without the risk to yourself. So, 
in this particular situation, white would be able to quickly open up the position on the queen side and black who is playing too many moves on the queen side might live to regret it because instead of spending some time to create threats against white's position, black is accepting the battle on the part of the board that is not all that good for black. Another possibility after um, the move a5 would be to simply defend the pawn with bishop to a3. Black can take and then play b6, stopping you from further opening the queen side with c5. But that does not stop this pawn from going to a4, then to a5. And like in the previous variation, well, the position will eventually get open on the queen side. So b4 would be a quite good way, a very legitimate way of continuing um, with the attack on the queen side. Another way of continuing might be to play a move like this, knight e1. Knight e1 may look at first sight like a very weird move, because here we have the knight that is closer to the middle of the board, closer to the center of the board, and what are we doing? We are going backwards with this knight. But you have to keep in mind that on f3, this knight no longer has anything to do. This knight is not putting the pressure on the pawn, which is protected by another pawn. This knight can't go on d4. On the other hand, if we put this knight on d3, well, this knight is now helping us to go with c5 and open up the position on the queen side. And also the knight is clearing the f3 square, which can be used to reinforce the white's pawn formation in the center and make it more difficult for black to organize the counterplay on the king side. So, when trying to find out the plan, try to look at where the pieces currently are and what would be the best possible square for each of the pieces. In this case, because this knight has finished its job, well, we are now looking for the better place for that knight. And going to e1 and then to d3 and helping with c5, might be the best thing for white to do in this kind of a position. So let's now look at the position from, from black's point of view. What is black going to do? We found out that yes, it is best for black to attack on the king side, but how? Remember, there is the second question that you need to ask yourself, and that is, can I attack with pieces only, or do I need pawns to help me out? It turns out that black definitely need the help of pawns in this position. Now, why is that? You can see that white has the perfect pawn structure in front of the king, and typically it would be quite difficult to attack this pawn structure if it's perfect. There are no weaknesses. There is nothing that you can latch onto. And those pawns are ready to go to f3 or g3 or h3 if there is a need for that. So, it's quite obvious that black does need the help of a pawn or two in order to put white in trouble on the king side. So then the next logical question would be which pawn do we use to attack? Do we start pushing the h pawn? And well, you can see that that would create some problems with dark squares, but wouldn't really be a big problem for white. If you start pushing the g pawn, it's the same thing. You're not really helping black's position a lot. And here we have to come to the conclusion that the best way for black to proceed in this position would be to play pawn from f7 to f5 and put pressure on white center. That would either allow black to open the f file or to play f5 and then f4 and to start pawn storming white's position on the king side. Where do we move the knight? Because the knight is in the way. The knight is stopping us from going f5 at the moment. Well, there are two squares at the moment that the knight can go to. One would be e8, the other would be d7. Which one is better? You might think that it is e8 because it keeps this diagonal for the bishop open. But on the other hand, from e8, this knight is not controlling the center very well. And sometimes, you know, you can switch from one plan to another if the situation dictates so. And in this case, if the knight is far away from the middle, white might be able to go knight e3 and after f5 to open up the position with f4, making 
use of the fact that his species are now better developed than black species. It's hard for black to connect the rooks, for this knight it's hard to control the center, and white is well po poised to strike back in the middle of the board. This knight, however, would be a lot better on d7, because from d7 it makes c5 harder, it also controls the super important square on e5. And so let's continue with knight to d7. So it was knight e1, knight to d7, knight goes to d3, so white is continuing with his plan, and black's next move is f7 to f. Five. Okay, what should white do? Keep in mind that if you take here, well, you still have a little bit of extra space on the queen side. But now it is black who has much, much better position on the king side. Here we have two mobile pawns that can start moving at any point. They haven't been blocked. The G file is open that can potentially be used by black it wouldn't be the very best way for white to proceed. What would be better? Well, reinforcing the position with f3 would be better, but rather than doing that immediately, white is using this moment to connect his heavy pieces over here and to develop the last remaining piece, this bishop. It goes from c1 to d2. All right, well, we moved the pawn to f5. What now? What would be the best way for black to proceed? What are the options? Well, black can open the f5. No doubt about that. Or perhaps proceed with f4 and gain some space on the king side. Or play a move like knight f6 of the knight that moved away to make f7, f5 possible is now going back in order to put more pressure onto white center. These would be the three options to consider. Taking on e4 is possible, but that allows one of white's knights to go on e4. And this knight is now a very good piece and you can't really chase it away with a pawn. What's more, white can reinforce it. White can go f3, knight f2 if need be, put a bishop on d3, put a queen on c2. So when you get rid of the knight on e4, there will be another piece going on e4, e4 becomes a very, very good outpost for white species. And for that reason, taking on e4 would not be the best way for uh, black to continue. How about f4? That is very consistent in black's plans. Yes, however, this is one of the rare cases whereby this bishop on c8 is potentially better than this bishop on f3. Have a look at this position after f3. So this pawn, this bishop here on, on e2, well, I said pawn, it really is reduced to being a pawn right now because um, um, it doesn't have any diagonals that are open and the activity of this bishop is very much curtailed by the fact that so many pawns are on light squares. So this bishop does not have much of a future. This bishop, on the other hand, if black is going to play g5 and g4 and start opening the position in front of the white king, this bishop will, would be more than handy. And so white's position would be improved if white could simply magically move those pieces away from the board, um, exchange his bishop on e2 for the bishop on c8, because then for black to continue the attack on the king side would be very hard. It turns out that if black plays f4 immediately in this position, this is exactly what white can do, because white now has the chance to put his bishop on g4, and sooner or later, this bishop will have to be exchanged for the bishop on c8. Sooner or later, black is going to move this knight. It is not possible to chase the bishop away, because the bishop will just lodge itself to e6, and from a really horrible looking bishop on e2 that is not doing very much, all of a sudden we have this mighty piece right there in the center, in the very core of black's position, causing problems. The position is better for white. For that reason, what black wants to do is to put his knight on f6, and now the knight and the pawn are 
putting more pressure on, on white central pawn, on, on white pawn on e4, forcing white to play f3, and closing this diagonal so this bishop can no longer get out easily. The next move is going to be pawn from f5 to f4, and black is now ready to start attacking on the king side. Okay, let's turn back to white. Well, from white's point of view, there are no immediate threats, right? There is nothing that black can do in the next one or two, or maybe even three moves. So, it is time to proceed with the plan and open the c file. And white's next move is going to be c5. What is that white wants to do here? Well, what white is going to do next is exchange um, his c pawn for the d pawn, uh, creating the uh, permanently potentially weak pawn on d6 and opening the c file. At this stage, this knight on c3, sorry, this knight on d3 will have finished its job. So it helped c5, the pawns have been swapped. It's not all that clear what is that kid this knight can do now. So how about putting it on f2? And from f2, this knight will make it more difficult for black to go g5, g4 and, attacks, and attack white's position. Um, white can now proceed to do something about this c file that has been opened. For example, white can put his rook on c1, put a queen on c2, and now white is ready to go knight b5 and start making threats on this part of the board. Or perhaps the queen will go to b3 and white will then double the rooks and again try to infiltrate black's position with a move knight b5. A word of caution when you are playing knight b5. You have to be sure that this knight can go from b5 to c7 when you decide to play the move knight to b5. If the knight can't go to c7, let's say that black has something like this, you know. Um, let's say that black has his rook on f7 already, that the knight is controlling the square c7, and there is no way for this knight to be planted on c7. Then, regardless of where this queen is, uh, let's say on c2 or on b3, it would be possible for black to chase the knight away. And once black has played b5, it is so hard for this knight to come back into the game, and white's action on queen side has pretty much stopped. So now it will be black's turn to keep on attacking white on the queen side. So, when you play knight b5, you have to make sure that this knight can go on c7, or if the knight can't go to c7, then it's a good idea to play a4 first, and only then put the knight on b5. That way, you will be stopping black from playing b5. And as you can see, now this knight can go into the game with knight c4, the bishop can go on a5, attacking the queen, the knight can go on b6, with a deadly, devastating attack on the queen side. So, um, just keep in mind that it is quite okay for your opponent to slow you down on the part of the board that, that gives you better chances, but it wouldn't be okay if your opponent stops you altogether, because then it becomes, as we know, playing on one goal. Okay, so this is in a nutshell what white is trying to do. How about black? So those pawns have been swapped off. The knight is on f6. Pawn takes on d6, pawn takes on d6, knight goes to f2. Let's now go back to this position to look at it from black's perspective. Okay, we know that black will have to defend the queen side, and that black might not be able to hold white off forever. But Black might be able to slow white down. On the other hand, what black really wants to do is to organize his counterplay over here because of the concentration of the pieces that is all pointing to the queen side. Now, this pawn that has gone to f4 is now blocked. The f file is closed. So, if the f file is closed, then it's not going to open anytime soon. What would be a good plan for black? Well, it turns out that if the f file is closed, a good plan would be to, op 
to open the G file. Now, the G file leads directly to the white king. How do we do that? Well, let's swap the rook and the bishop. As you know, this pawn on d6 is going to be potentially weak in, in the future. Well, this bishop from f8 will be well positioned to protect it. And this rook from g7 will be opposed to the king and will be helping g5, g4, opening the position in front of the king and then going for the checkmate. So, swapping off the bishop and the rook would be um, a, a very good plan for black in this position. And black can start with the move rook f7. Then as white continues with his plan, black's next move can be pawn to g5. White on his part, even though he doesn't want to uh, pick up the fight on the king side because black is better on the king side, white will do his best to slow black down. And at the moment, white has one, two, three, four, five controls on the g4 square. And because g4 is quite critical for black, without playing g4, it will be very hard for black to attack. Then this move h3 certainly comes into consideration to make it more difficult for black to create counterplay on the king side. So in the next few moves, black is going to play h5, complete the maneuver that he has started. So he will put the bishop on f8. He will put the rook on g7, and then he will look for the right opportunity to play g4. If g4 is not possible immediately, perhaps black will decide to bring reinforcements, to bring more pieces on, on the king side. You can see how this bishop is quite instrumental in playing g5 to g4. That's the reason why black in really doesn't want to swap off those two bishops, even though in the vast majority of cases, the bishop on c8 is generally a problem for the black pieces in the vast majority of openings. Not in this particular case though. In this case, this bishop is really very handy because it is helping um, g5, g4 and opening the position in front of the king. Okay, well white won't be able to sit here and do nothing forever. And um, if, if there is nothing better to do, black is going to happily sacrifice one pawn in order to open up the position in front of the king. So white is going to continue with his plan. Queen b3, rook c2, rook c1. This knight will go on b5. White may prepare it with a4 and then try to penetrate the position with knight c7 or perhaps, you know, take this pawn on a7 because when the rook takes, this rook will be able to take on c8. Um, and if the knight is able to go to c7 at some stage, then this knight can block off the line of attack for this bishop with knight to e6 and this position would be pretty hopeless for black. Black would be forced to give up his bishop for, for the knight and the position would open up in a very favorable way for white. So that's why when white plays knight to b5, white wants to make sure that he can go to c7 or that he can take on a7. Um, either way, the knight is better off staying on, on c3 up until that moment. And eventually white will be able to put more pressure on black on the queen side and black is hoping to be able to put heaps of counter pressure on white's position on the king side. Which side is going to win? Well, I can tell you that the position is very finely balanced. And if white wastes a couple of moves doing nothing, then black's chances, I would really favor black's chances. On the other hand, if black is too slow organizing his attack, then white will be able to break through the queen side and just hold off black enough, long enough until he has decisive advantage on the queen side. So just to recap, how did we come up with the best possible plan for white and the best possible plan for black? The one thing that we were looking at all the time is the pawn structure. It is the pawn structure that determines the action for white and for black in this particular example. With this pawn on d5, white has more advantage on the more space on the queen side, white potentially can obtain a lot more advantage on the queen side. This is white's principal field of action. The next question, would it be okay to attack with pieces only or do we need 
pawns to help us. And in this case, yes, we do need hope pawns to help us. So by playing c4 to c5, exchanging those two pawns, opening up the c file and making a backward pawn, white is sort of cementing his advantage on the queen side and making sure that he will be better off no matter what when it comes to queen side action. Black on his side is not really waiting for white to break through on the queen side. Instead, black is starting action on his own, asking the same questions. Would it be okay to attack with pieces on the king side or do we need the help of pawns? And once we find out that yes, we definitely need pawns to help us, it's the F pawn that is most instrumental, instrumental in creating that pressure. So black organizes f5 and then grabs the space on the king side with f4 and after that going for the g5 and g4 breakthrough becomes the best plan for black. The rook and the bishop are being swapped off so that the rook can be directly opposed to the king and go for the checkmate. If need be, black is going to bring more pieces closer to the king. This queen will be ready to rejoin the action at some stage and sooner or later black is going to play g4 opening everything up over here and go for the checkmate. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video there is one more thing that you will enjoy as well. Recently I've been analyzing the results of different students of the Remote Chess Academy and I've been checking who are the guys who got the greatest amount of progress and it came down to the group of people who studied some of our most fundamental courses such as the Grandmaster's Positional Understanding. And not only those guys study these courses, but they also really master the skill. And that's the level that helps you to gain three, sometimes even five additional hundred rating points just after mastering a certain one course. And that's why I've decided to open a new enrollment for this course. This way you're not just going to be studying the, you know, watching the video lessons, but you will also get my personal support. I'll be helping you in case you have any questions, you can ask them. You will also have the connection to the other students who are within the same group. And finally, you'll be also receiving certain tasks that will help you to practice and to master the skills necessary. That's why we're going to open up this enrollment, get a certain group of students that we can handle and provide my personal attention to, and then we're going to close the enrollment and stop accepting new students. So if you don't want to miss out, if you want to be in that group of people who are going to significantly improve their chess results after studying and mastering this program, Check out the link down below and I'll see you there.